one and all, and listen to tales of excitement and adventure. Tales of daring heroes, savage monsters, and bards who just couldn't keep it in their pants. Tales of friendship, nobility, drunken foolishness, and unforgettable fun. These are tales of role-playing games, fair listeners, and this is Rollin' Bones. My name is Ryan Howard, and I shall be your guide. Good evening, Boneheads, and welcome to Rollin' Bones with Ryan Howard, your RPG treasure trove. I am your host and king of the Boneheads, Ryan Howard, and tonight uh, we've got a little bit of a change in the schedule, as you see Ronan's tail behind me there. Uh, Ben Barsh was supposed to be on the show tonight. He had to cancel due to a uh, last-minute schedule change. Some family came into town, Uh, so we'll be rescheduling. We'll have Ben on the show at some point. And uh, instead, tonight, what we're going to do is another uh, character creation show. And specifically, we are going to talk about creating a gladiator in 5th edition. You guys, give me just a second here. I'm going to turn up my microphone a little bit. Is that up or down? All right, there we go. That should be good. And yes, thank you, LT. My... I guess my hair does look shiny. It's getting to be that time of year where my hair goes from my hair goes from brown to kind of a like dark blonde. I'll hold him up for everyone. He's gonna be angry here in just a second. Oh, I love this boy. I love this boy so much. I really do. I was thinking you've got a funny way of showing it, pal. But you know what? I love that boy so much. Audio listeners, I really feel bad for you because you didn't just get to see Ronan. So if you want to, uh, Roland Bones on YouTube, that's where you can uh, see what my cat looks like. And you can also join us live here on Twitch Monday nights at 8 p.m. Central. Yes, unfortunately his appearances are somewhat rare, although he recently has had a proclivity for jumping up on my desk so maybe he'll be a more regular appearance here on rolling bones as he jumps back up on the desk very clearly hungry for more definitely ready to you're not gonna no you're not gonna play that game with me pony not not tonight we're not we're not doing this you guys are gonna have to give me one second he's parked himself on top of my mouse And inevitably, when I reach for it, he's going to bite me because he's an asshole. So you guys are going to have to give me a second here. All right. It looks like he is uh, settled over on the other side of the desk. So, uh, yeah, with with that, we can uh, we can move on and uh, begin our discussion of gladiators and how to play one in 5th edition. So I'm going to move on over to screen share. I've got some stuff to show you guys tonight. So, uh, yeah, I'll see you on the other side. All right, here we are. Screen share. And what I've got open right now... Yes, yes, I do have my my Roman helmet in the background. Uh, which I would put on Ronan if he would cooperate with me, but, you know, there's your plans, and then there's the cats. But no, what we've got open right now is Xanathar's Guide to Everything, um, supplemental 5th edition material for those of you not familiar with 5e, all three of you, um, And what this is, is the College of Swords. Now, this is ultimately not what I ended up going with, uh, but this is one avenue that you can take as far as playing a gladiator. And what this is, is a subclass of the Bard. 
And basically, um, these are entertainers who entertain using weapons. Uh, you know, they, they're knife throwers, they're jugglers, uh, sword swallowers, uh, gladiators fall into this as far as, uh, you know, like they, sometimes they stage mock combats. This is where like using your, your fighting as an art form or as a performance art comes in, uh, to the, the bard side of things. And the reason why I didn't want to go with this um, first and foremost, I wanted to avoid magic with this build. I wanted this to be kind of a pure, uh, you know, this is what a gladiator is like. No magic, no spells, nothing like that. Um, and, the you know, if you're going to be a bard, then you've got spells. Uh, the other reason I didn't go with this is this is not a good example of how to play a bard because the bard is usually a support class with a heavy focus on, uh, you know, buffing with uh, inspiration or bardic inspiration, rather. And the whole point of the College of Swords is you're not really doing that. You're you're using your inspiration slots to improve your own attacks. So really, you're kind of becoming a striker or DPS, you're, you're more of a rogue than you are a bard, really, or more of a, uh, more of a dexterity fighter. And the last reason why I didn't want to go with this particular build is I've already done a, a bard with a dip and fighter, uh, when we made the scald, that's what I did. Um, so yeah, I, I've already done something similar to this, um, so I figured I wouldn't go down that path again. But just to kind of, you know, take a look at what you've got here, um, you know, as a bard, you start off with proficiency in longsword, short swords, rapiers, uh, light crossbow, hand crossbow, and when you take this at third level, you gain proficiency with medium armor and scimitars, um... And then if you're proficient with simple or martial melee weapon, you can use it as a spellcasting focus. So instead of using your instrument, you are using your sword. You get a fighting style at third level. Uh, there's only two options, dueling and two-weapon fighting. Um, and of the two, dual-weapon fighting is really what you'd want to go for with this. So I guess if you were doing like a two-weapon gladiator, maybe this would be better option for you. I've done so many two-weapon builds recently, I wanted to, again, do something a little bit different. And then you also get your blade flourishes at third level. And, uh, you know, what this is, is they take up your inspiration slots. Uh, whenever you take the attack action on your turn, your walking speed increases by 10 feet until the end of the turn. And if a weapon attack that you make as part of this action hits a creature, you can use one of the following blade flourish options of your choice. So there's a defensive flourish. You can expand one use of your inspiration to cause the weapon to deal extra damage to the target you hit. The damage equals the number you roll on your inspiration dice. And then you add that number to your AC until the start of your next turn. Slashing Flourish. Um, you deal extra damage to a target that you hit. And to any other creature of your choice that you can see within 5 feet of you. Kind of similar to what the Slasher feat allows you to do. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly from Tasha's Cauldron. But yeah. And then Mobile Flourish, you can expend one use of your Inspiration, um, deal extra damage, and then you can push the target up to five feet away from you, plus the number of feet equal to the number you roll on the die. You can then immediately use your reaction to move up to your walking speed to an unoccupied space within five feet of the target. 
So yeah, I mean, there's there's cool things you can do with that. Uh, extra attack at 6th level, you get your extra attack, and then you get a Master's Flourish at 14th level. Um, and you can roll a d6 and use it instead of expending an Inspiration die. So at 14th level, uh, which is beyond the tier that people usually get to, again, you know, D&D classes, except for the Monk, are front-loaded, uh, because of this, but at 14th level, you can start to act like a regular bard again. But until then, you know, that's... You're using your inspiration on yourself. And you still have spells, so that's kind of really what I wanted to avoid. This is, I didn't want a spell sword build here. Moving on from there, um, another way that's quote-unquote official to build a... Uh, a gladiator would be to use Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. They have a Battlemaster build uh, for the gladiator. And, you know, none of these builds are very good, I'll say. Some of them are okay, but most of them aren't very good. Um, you know, like we looked at the uh, the Pugilist at one point, and it's, it just doesn't really stack up all that well. But, you know, the gladiator, you've got the, the number of feats that you end up taking with this is kind of ridiculous. Uh, athlete, charger, dual wielder, durable, grappler, savage attacker, tough, weapon master. Um, that's a lot of feats. And I know that fighters get more uh, stat increases than any other class, so you've got the chance to still up your uh, strength and constitution as you go, but that's a lot of sacrifices to make at that point. Um, fighting styles, defense, and two-weapon fighting. I'm going to object to the defense fighting style because it is related to wearing armor, and I know that a Battlemaster fighter will be wearing armor, but gladiators, uh, they typically are depicted as wearing either no armor or very piecemeal armor. And with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and move on to my character build, which is part Battlemaster, but also part uh, Barbarian. I took three levels of Barbarian to start uh, for a couple reasons. So, going into the historical context of what a gladiator was, in the Roman world, gladiators were slaves taken in war that were then, you know, sold into fighting in the pits. So, who's going to end up being gladiators in Rome? Now, this would be more, you know, late empire, but, you know, you're fighting barbarians, fighting the uh, the Celts, the Gauls, Visigoths. So the people who are typically thought of as barbarians are gonna end in, are gonna end up being the enemies that you very often uh, would would subjugate and take as slaves and therefore gladiators. So, to reflect this, I started as a barbarian. Now, I did standard array here, and I took uh, 15 to strength, 14 to constitution, 13 I actually put into charisma, 12 into dexterity, 10 into wisdom, and 8 into intelligence. Um, and again, I don't like having negative stats, uh, in general. I know with the standard array, you're typically going to end up with one, because who's going to put ability score increases into their dump stat? But, the reason why this doesn't bother me so much is, you know, if Razor ran Corvus, my, uh, my gladiator is indeed a slave, he's probably illiterate, especially if he comes from a barbarian background. So, 
Uh, him having a negative intelligence is not a problem for me. I also don't like having a plus nothing modifier to wisdom just for, you know, the sake of perception checks, but again, uh, you know, just not going to be a perfect build. And I'm I'm kind of starting to grow cold towards this idea of perfect builds, if I'm being perfectly honest. Recently, I've been kind of, you know, examining role-playing and stuff like that. And while I love doing these character-building videos, just to show, you know, flavor-wise how things are done and talk a little bit about different kinds of characters you can play, um, you know, ultimately, I, I'm... I'm not so much interested in what's the most powerful character I can possibly play anymore. In fact, uh, in the next couple weeks, we'll be doing some episodes on uh, a little bit more hardcore uh, types of games and, you know, characters who aren't as, you know, easy to survive with, characters who die a lot faster. That is... Uh, We'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the of the stream here tonight, but for the time being, let's take a look at, you know, what this gives us. So, you know, you're starting Barbarian. Uh, if you take three levels, you can go up to your Primal Path. Ultimately, you can probably get away with just two in Barbarian if you want to do this. I kind of wanted to get the Frenzy from... Uh, the Berserker path, though, because it, uh, you know, flavor-wise it works out like, you know, it's it's kind of his Hulk-up moment in the arena. Uh, you know, he goes into a frenzy. It's, it's something that I kind of stole from one of my players, actually. Kevin, in my Dark Sun game, is playing the Shivering Claw, who's a uh, Berserker Barbarian. A Thrykreen Berserker Barbarian, but he used to be a Gladiator. Uh, and he ended up winning his freedom. Hey, Clever, how you doing? Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Anyway, Kevin, uh, the Shivering Claw, ended up winning his freedom. And, uh, you know, went about an adventure. We'll get back to that in a little bit because, you know, we'll be talking about uh, reasons why you would play a gladiator in a D&D &D game. Um... But, you know, he, a lot of the stuff that uh, the Shivering Claw does in the game is stuff that would be like showmanship in the arena. And so Frenzy is kind of like his, his comeback, to use a wrestling term. This is the point where, you know, he uh, if he was Jerry Lawler, he would drop the strap on a singlet. Uh, you know, if he was Hulk Hogan, he'd do the you and stop selling. Um... If he was Steve Austin, he'd give, you know, the double middle fingers and then uh, hit a stunner or something like that. You know, I don't want to go too terribly far down the uh, the wrestling rabbit hole. But, yeah. That's what I envisioned as a frenzy. The other way, and I just want to make sure that I'm getting this. Uh, just want to make sure I'm getting this right as far as the... Uh, Totem Warrior goes. Because if you go Path of the Totem Warrior, which is generally considered one of the better ways to, to go with uh, Barbarian, um, if you take the Bear Spirit, uh, you have resistance to all damage except psychic damage. The spirit of the bear makes you tough enough to stand up to any punishment. Um, so at that point, you know, you, you don't just resist slashing, piercing, uh, bludgeoning. You also resist every everything but psychic, as it says. So ultimately, um, and now that I'm seeing it like this, it makes a lot of sense, but ultimately... Uh, Going Path of the Totem Warrior and taking the Bear Totem might end up being better for you in the long run, especially if you stick with what I kind of have going here, in that even when you go into the fighter side of things, you never end up wearing armor. But we'll get into that as we uh, keep talking about this. 
So yeah, that's, you know, you get all the cool stuff from being a uh, barbarian. You get unarmored defense, which for anyone who doesn't know is con plus dexterity plus 10 as your armor class. And you can still get this with a shield. Um, so that's where the 16 comes in. I am a variant human, so I started with the Shield Master feat, which is great. Anytime you've got a character using a shield, you want to take Shield Master. Basically, as a bonus action, you can Shield Bash. You make an attack. If you hit, you knock your opponent prone, dealing no damage. But then you get to attack with advantage. So, basically, the whole idea of what Razor Rand Corvus is going to be doing here, especially when you get into the uh, combat superiority maneuvers that he has, it's a lot of getting the opponent knocked over so that you and your friends have advantage on the attacks. So this is a guy who's going to run up to the front and basically like knock people over with a shield, trip them... Uh, knock him down, you know, do, do everything that he can to get people grounded and then finish him off. And that's, you know, that would be his strategy in the arena, but that would also be, you know, a way to work with a, you know, a group fighting. And, you know, you can flavor this like, you know, he would tag team with the guy with the trident and, you know, maybe he would throw the net or if he missed with the net, he would bash with the shield, and then the guy with the trident would come up and stab whatever creature or team they were fighting. You know, there's there's all kinds of cool stuff you can build into the backstory with all this. But, you know, all of that to say, I'm starting as a barbarian. And then from there, uh, you get into the fighter side of things. I went Battlemaster because Battlemaster is... For all intents and purposes, the best fighter archetype, in my opinion. Uh, you get the most bang for your buck. He's not the fighteriest fighter, that's the champion, but still, you know, you, you get a lot for what you're doing as, you know, the battle master. Battle masters are very versatile, and you can flavor them in pretty much any way that you want to. That's the main advantage of if you're looking at the, the builds in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, even if you don't like the builds and you want to play around with them like I did here, you still get the sense of unique archetypes for specific uh, fighters and the way that they're built out, even if everyone's a battle master. People can still feel different, use different weapons, all that. As a battle master, let's see. Just to reference things here. Uh, fighting style that I'm taking just early on as a fighter. Um, would I recommend someone to study, or how would I recommend uh, someone study the system? Um, definitely get the book. Um that's really going to be the best way to absorb it. Obviously, you, you want to own the book. One good thing to do with any system, 5e, Pathfinder, well, Pathfinder especially, I'm finding out that the hard way, go through the books and build out sample characters. Uh, just, you know... Take a look at any class you want to play, anything like that, and, and build a character step by step. And then you can flip to the... Even if you just have the player's handbook, flip to the back and take a look at, you know, the stats for an orc. And then run yourself through combat against that orc. You've got your stats listed out. Their stats are there on the table... Um, and just make sure that everything you're reading matches up with what you are doing, uh, as you're in combat. Cause, and this is, this is a really big thing. And this is one of the, uh, one of the things that really kind of makes people, uh, 
let me back up from that. One of the things that people don't realize, if they read the book but don't get to play very often, there are some things in the books that look good on paper. They sound awesome. They sound like they'd be really, really cool. But once you're in the heat of combat, in the action economy, you find out that, oh, it takes this much to do this thing that I'm looking to do. Or this only works if there's this, this, and this in the party. Yes, True Strike. True Strike is a fantastic example of that. But yeah, just, you know, make sample characters in classes that you're interested in. Try to, uh, you know, run some mock combats. Because you can do just a one-on-one -on -one combat without a dungeon master. Uh, roll back and forth. To make sure that your character is, you know, what you want them to be. And then, uh, you know, just, you know, keep referencing the rules. Don't be afraid to screw up in the first few sessions and really if you are consistent if you play every week or you know play pretty often and you really read your character's abilities and know what they mean and comprehend them at the table maybe even have side conversations with your dungeon master just to make sure you're interpreting the rules right after a month, after the first month playing, you'll know your character like the back of your hand, and even just doing the math will be second nature. Even as you level up and add to those numbers, it's just, oh yeah, you add this and this. And honestly, the character sheet is a great benefit for you there, as long as you're up to date on everything, you know... You as far as weapon attacks go, as long as you keep this thing updated, it tells you all the math that you need. And if you're playing a spellcaster and you've got, you know, spells that require attacks, like if you're a warlock and you Eldritch Blast a lot, uh, you can stick Eldritch Blast in this box. So yeah, just... Make yourself some notes, some cheat sheets if there's stuff that you're just not getting. Uh, reference cards for any complicated abilities or spells if you want to write them on a 3x5 card. Okay. So you're, you're the GM. Awesome. Friends of first time GM. Um, yeah, I mean... Yeah, ro rolling characters definitely does give you a better grasp on the rules. This is one of the uh, this is one of the problems that forever GMs have. Uh, we don't get to see things from the player side very often. One of my biggest weaknesses as a GM is when I'm running for casters. Um, when I get to play, I play martial characters. I love swinging a sword and dealing some damage. So when casters have questions, a lot of times I'm just as lost in the woods as they are. So it's, you know, sometimes it's a lot of flipping over there and just reading over. And honestly, Clever, you know, as a GM, no one can learn all the rules. No one can memorize them all by heart. I'm sure you're well aware of this. Um... It's just kind of knowing them well enough and knowing the system well enough to be able to, you know, make a ruling quickly and on the fly. But yes, rolling more characters is definitely going to help you get a grasp on the rules. Even if you never get to play them. I've got a whole... Not graveyard, but it, it's like my own version of the uh, the clone factory on Camino, just full of characters that have not been played, with a thousand more on the way.
But yeah, with this, uh, with this gladiator character, with Ran Corvus, uh, what you're looking at here is a character who is designed to hit things. And pretty much only hit things. Hit things and draw aggro. That's what you're doing with this particular build. Now, the, the one thing I did want to mention here, which kind of breaks the, uh, kind of breaks the the rules as far as what you're supposed to do with a fighter. Uh, Charisma is a high stat for him. And this is purely because Rand is a performer. In addition to being a warrior, Rand is also a performer. So, all of his skills are invested in acrobatics, athletics, and perception. But then the other ones are intimidation and performance. Um, so what you have here is someone who could act... If you're in a party with no face, you could almost get away with being the party face. In fact, you know, with a plus two to charisma, if everyone else dumped charisma, you're the de facto party face. But if you've got a, you know, a rogue or a warlock or someone like that with a high charisma or bard... God, there's always a bard. Um, I I need to com compartmentalize that rant. I've still not done an episode on the bard. That might be a whole stream in and of itself. But with that level of charisma, you can act as a party face. And you know, ultimately what this does in-game... There are a couple of combat maneuvers that will, you know, call for a charisma check. Um, as a performer, you'd be, like, trying to hype the crowd with your charisma. In fact, um, one of the games that comes to mind with a character like this would be something set in an arena. Uh, entirely built around some kind of gladiatorial combat or tournament or interlocking tournaments. I'll talk about that towards the end here. But in something like that, I would allow players to make charisma checks to get the audience on their side. And if the audience is on their side, then I would give them inspiration or some kind of bonus to their roles or saving throws or something like that. There'd be some kind of benefit to having the crowd on your side, and that's where charisma would come in, in a game that I was running. But in general, this would just allow you to kind of serve as a backup face or even a full-on party face uh, in the event of emergencies. Now, as far as weaknesses in this build, um, you're not going to get many feats out of this one. I, I guess you could. Like, if we look at the fighter level up path look at uh, what all's coming your way since you're only taking set or since you're burning three levels on barbarian you you still get a good amount of ability score improvements actually hold the phone did I I missed an ability score improvement I missed an ability score improvement, I'm pretty sure. I believe I did. So in that case, we're bumping this bad boy up to an 18. There we go. So yeah, you you can use uh, the ability score improvements to take something like uh, Polearm Master or Sentinel, if you ultimately want to be a uh, you know a shield and spear guy, kind of a, a Hopolite Spartan build. That's a good way to get some extra damage for anyone who's not aware of what Polearm Master and Sentinel do. They work together. These are things that make pole arms actually very, very good as far as uh, 
weapons go. But with Polar Master, when you take the attack action and attack with only a glaive, halberd, quarterstaff, or spear, you can use a bonus action to make a melee attack with the opposite end of the weapon. Uh, same ability as the primary attack modifier, you deal a d4 bludgeoning damage on the other side. And then while you're wielding a glaive, halberd, pike, quarterstaff, or spear, other creatures provoke an opportunity attack from you when they enter your reach when they enter the reach you have with that weapon. So your reach is 10 feet. So Polar Master gives you uh, 10 feet of opportunity attack. Basically, it widens the square around which people have to stop when they come at you or you know when they're trying to leave your area. So it helps you keep people in close without them being up to where they can get you with their weapons. So, you know, there's that. And then if we go to Sentinel... Sentinel, when a creature... When you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, the creature's speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. Creatures provoke attacks of opportunity from you even if they take the disengage action before leaving your reach. So basically, they're not getting away with you without you getting a swipe at them. And then when a creature within five feet of you makes an attack against a target other than you, and the target doesn't have this feat, you can use your reaction to make a melee weapon attack against the attacking creature. And with uh, Polearm Master, you know, you can increase that out to ten. So... If you wanted to take a spear as your weapon, instead of the longsword like I have here, you can still have the shield, because uh, spear and shield, uh, they, they've clarified that you can use a spear one-handed, so spear and shield is a viable build uh, for a gladiator. Again, you'd have kind of a 300 vibe here. But basically, this lets you attack anything that comes within 10 feet of you and they can't go anywhere. So, you know, that that's good to have. It keeps enemies from getting away from you, which, you know, is good. But, I mean, basically with a fighter, you know, as this guy levels, obviously your proficiency bonus goes up. Um, you get multiple ability score improvements, so just going off of this, um, I took seven levels of fighter for this guy, so fourth and sixth, you get ability score improvements. At eighth, you get an ability score improvement. So yeah, I mean, by, by eighth level... In theory, like, by the next level, I can have my strength maxed out. And then I can focus on Constitution, uh, which I'll max out in two ability score increases. And then from there, if I don't want to go with the, uh, you know, if I don't want to go the Polearm Master route, I can start bumping my Charisma or my Dexterity. Uh, but, you know, maxing out Con because of the unarmored defense, that's how you get more AC. That's how you get more hit points. So, you know, basically you're turning yourself into a, a giant tank at that point. And there's a few feats that uh, show up in Tasha's Cauldron. I just got to get uh, to where they are. And the feats will, uh, you know, if, you're, if your GM allows for feats... then you can use some of these to your advantage. I'm probably going the wrong way. Personalized spells, magic items. A 
I swear they're in here. There they are. Feats. Yeah, so, you know, if you're if you're using a spear, you can take piercer. You get an extra bump to your strength or dexterity. Uh, slasher, same strength or dexterity. And these allow you to do some extra things, like slasher, which would be the move here if I stuck with my, uh, my sword and board build here. Increase my strength or dexterity by 1 to a maximum of 20. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals slashing damage, you can reduce the speed of the target by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. Again, uh, maybe a little bit redundant with Shield Master since I'm knocking them prone. But that does keep them from standing up and running away. And then when you score a critical hit that deals slashing damage to a creature, you grievously wound it until the start of your next turn. The target has disadvantage on all attack rolls. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's things that you can do here. And then if you want expertise, you could take skill expert... You know, theoretically. So there are some feats that are worth investment, especially with the number of ability score increases that a fighter gets. So my, I, er, I retract my previous comment about not having uh, many feats. So you'll, you'll get the opportunity for feats. You'll get the opportunity to max out your constitution and your strength. Um... And really, those are your two main stats. Charisma, again, charisma is a tertiary stat. If you want to raise it a little bit more, uh, maybe you are the party's face and you need to maybe bump it to 16 at most. Uh, then, sure, once once you've got one of these two big ones, strength or constitution, squirreled away, maybe you can focus a little bit more on charisma, but, you know, th these are your priorities. Maybe maybe even dexterity, depending on what you're looking to do. But yeah, for the most part, this is a very competitive build. It's certainly different. Um, and it's not going to stand up to someone's like min-maxed munchkin fighter. But in capturing the flavor of what a gladiator historically was and how they're typically portrayed in the media... As far as usually wearing a helmet, a shoulder pad, and then like a sword and a shield, usually bare chested uh, with like a loincloth or something like that. To pull that off in uh, 5e, you need to go with unarmored defense as far as being a barbarian. An arm unarmored defense. I really do wish was something that other classes could invest in as a feat or something like that. Because I can think of so many ways in which that would be beneficial to, you know, a fighter. Like, if, if we go back to that pugilist build, uh, most of the time, flavor-wise, pugilists are not wearing heavy armor or any kind of armor. So, you know, putting unarmored defense on them without going barbarian although you know you could do that with the uh i believe it's the primal warrior or something like that there, there's a uh there's a barbarian cl uh, subclass that's focused around essentially turning into a beast man so if you want to invest in that and then go into battle master fighter to be like a, a pit fighter you could do that. You could you could do that with this build too, if you just wanted to drop weapons all together, and uh, you know be a pit fighter. Sure. Again, 
as we talked about in the pit fighter video your mileage is not going to be great with that build unfortunately 5e is just not designed to allow someone using their bare hands as weapons to go very far it's a shame because you know something like that i think is cool but you know it is what it is they expect people to you know use weapons and armor so you gotta play with the cards you're dealt sometimes now, we've pretty much talked all that we can about the build here. Uh, there's not a whole lot to dwell on. I do want to show you guys some minis that I made for this build. So if we switch on over here, I can show you guys the uh, other screen I've got here. I've got uh, I've got chrome. Let's see. There we go. Alrighty. So, as you can see here, this was done in Hero Forge. I added some color to him just to. You know, let you guys see what I could do here. This is Rand Razor Corvus. Pretty cool. I gave him the buckler with the blade, even though that's not a thing in 5e. I thought it was cool. It's very, uh, it's very Dark Sun, and it's a very uh, gladiator. So, you know, I, I gave him that. And, of course, he has a gladius. Bare-chested, shoulder pads, helmet. If I can just for a minute talk about how irritating it is that beards clip through the helmets like this in every single miniature uh maker that you find online i don't know any way around it it's just you know we have to deal with that now uh while we're still kind of improving this technology but you know all in all I'd put that on the table. I'd get it unpainted so I could paint it, but, you know, I'd, that's, a, that's cool, in my opinion. I think that's cool, if I do say so myself, having made it. Now, what's even cooler, again, in my opinion, is what I made over here in Eldritch Foundry. Now, this one I didn't get to add any color to because they don't have that yet, but... You know, I like I like the look of certain things in Eldritch Foundry better than I like them in uh, Hero Forge. Let's go over to clothing here real quick just to, you know, like show off a, a difference here. Because right now I've got him in like some, some leather armor. They've got like, you know, chest harnesses and stuff like that. So if I remove the leather armor... Trying to see if they've got like a full on just chest harness or if I have to go shirtless. I think I'm just going to go shirtless with this one. So yeah, like if I take this off, you get a little bit more of a look as far as what Rand or Razor Rand Corvus looks like. And this is before, I made this guy before they fully had the, uh, let's bump it bump up the height here a little bit let's you know we can there we go get a little bit taller head size is fine chest good arm mass let's whoa that's weird big guy And lower body, yep. But yeah, that's this is what you can do with Eldritch Foundry versus Hero Forge. Again, it's basically the same idea that I'm working with here, but, you know, made them a little bit different. And I'm happy with the, uh, the results here. So yeah, that's the build. 
that's the build and these are the miniatures that I made to kind of go along with them. Um, I'm still yet to find a good gladiator miniature from like uh, Reaper or anything like that. So, you know, I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that. I probably should have done that in advance of this episode, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see if I can find something like that. So I'm going to switch back over to the solo and talk for a little bit here at the end of the episode about circumstances in which playing a gladiator would come up in a 5e game and you know ways that you can do cool things role play wise with gladiators so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about role playing a gladiator and scenarios in which they make sense so let's go ahead and do so all right we're back so gladiators gladiators are pit fighters they fight in an arena usually one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes against monsters, sometimes in team situations. But generally, they are entertainers, and they stay in one space. So, how is a gladiator going to end up in an adventuring party? For this, uh, the, the main way to do this in like a regular adventure setting, one that's not designed around gladiators, which I'll talk about in just a second, I'm going to lean back on the example of my friend Kevin, uh, the Shivering Claw. Claw won his freedom in the arena. And he's known nothing but the arena his whole life. He won his freedom, and now he's with this party, basically trying to figure out what to do with himself. And it is a very interesting and cool story. Because Kevin is playing this character, you know, a Thrykreen. For anyone unfamiliar with Dark Sun, Thrykreens are mantis men. And this character is not at all human. Like, you know, not just he's a bug man, but it was not at all human. Clever, thank you for stopping by. Um, you know, you've asked some, some great questions. Um... Definitely see you soon, and, uh, you know, thanks for tuning in. But yes, Mantis men uh, are not human, as we were saying. <laughs> yes, clever questions. And thank you for the, uh, the, the puppy, I'm assuming playing In Your Eyes, by... Uh, by Peter Gabriel, I like that song. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, to do that as a romantic gesture, I will just remind you that I'm married to Elfie. And, uh, yeah. So, I appreciate you playing in your eyes from your boombox outside my window. Uh, but I'd appreciate you not doing that at night when I'm trying to sleep. And it's, you know, I'm just going to go, hey, right on. I, too, enjoy Say Anything. So... Now, Elfie, if you would like to hold up a boombox and play in your eyes, that's a different story. Anyway, far afield of gladiators here. People who don't get to see the chat are uh, going to be very confused here. But anyway, um, gladiators. One way to, you know, I guess I should finish my story about the Shivering Claw. Um, essentially, what Kevin is playing with, with Claw, is because he has little concept of humanity and was basically raised in the pit, raised not just to fight and kill, but raised to be this, uh, like, human concept of what a bug man would act like. So he's very stiff, he's very jittery. He's called the Shivering Claw because when he rages, when he begins like his, his combat thing, he literally like shakes. He, he shakes with anger and, you know, it's... You know, he does this whole thing, kind of, you know, Ultimate Warrior style. But... 
he's dealing with this idea of, you know, there's there's other things to do than kill things or kill people. Not every problem has to be answered with violence. And also, you know, now that his world doesn't revolve around killing things, where does his purpose, like, where, where is his purpose in life derived from? If it's not to, you know, hear the crowd roar and chant his name and kill his enemy, what is he striving for? What's the meaning of his life? And ultimately, he found something to give him direction. However, that something was an axe that was haunted by a spirit of vengeance. Uh, so he got even more violent. And it's it's been a whole story, great series of moments, uh, you know, for this character. And it's, you know, it, it's really been cool seeing him play this character. But a gladiator... PC who's not a Thrykreen can just as easily do this. You are newly released from, you know, your bonds as a slave gladiator. Uh, your freedom is your own now. Your life is your own. You can do whatever you want. What do you want to do? How are you going to find a place for yourself in this world? And how are you now going to uh, interface with a team? Also, who out there knows who you are how famous are you you know were you a good gladiator these are things that you can go over with your uh with your dungeon master as far as how famous you are how many people would be familiar with your you know your record would anyone out there hold a grudge against you because you killed their favorite gladiator have kind of a, a situation again i keep talking about wrestling because I mean, it's it's very closely tied with you know the what gladiators are, so the comparisons are easy here. But if you ever listen to Jim Cornette talk about what it was like being the heel manager of the Midnight Express in the '80s, and like the hate mail that he would get, and you know people trying to fight him in the arena as he was leaving. And, you know, how you'd have to put a horseshoe in his tennis racket uh, in case he had to, like, hit someone. All these different things. People, you know, pulling guns on wrestlers. Wrestlers having to pull guns to leave the arena. All because people believed what they were doing was real and hated them for what they had done to their favorite wrestlers. In a world where, you know, that kind of performance is literally life or death where you know a gladiator can actually kill someone's favorite performer uh would there be any reciprocity there would there be any owners who were upset that you know he took out their top guy anyone gunning for him anyone upset that he took out their favorite gladiator anyone who wants to just you know prove that they're tougher than a gladiator because you hear about that, not just with wrestlers, but, you know, athletes of all kind, uh, MMA fighters. Sometimes people will get drunk in bars and come up to them and be like, hey, you're not so tough. I bet I could take you. So, you know, you're in a tavern and someone goes, hey, you're you're Razor Ran Corvus. You're not so bad. I, I, I could beat you right now. You know, how often does that kind of thing happen? Is that a regular thing? Do you have to, you know, travel around incognito? Um, you know, what what have you taken out of the arena with you? Uh, are you, you know, disfigured in some way? Are you injured? Were you fighting a lot of fixed fights? And now that you're, you know, out in the real world, this I actually stole from the College of Sword Bard and the... Uh, kind of like ideas around role playing them or maybe it was the gladiator entertainer variant um one of your flaws is you're so used to combat being favored in your odds or fixed in some way that when you get into real combat um it's a process you kind of freeze a little bit 
because you don't know the outcome coming out of it. It's not been predetermined. It's not, you know, the other guy's not going to take a dive. So there's a little bit of hesitancy, a little bit of uh, trepidation there. That's all valid stuff. And that's all stuff that can work in pretty much any campaign world. Now, one thing I want to talk about just, you know, as we kind of wrap up the discussion here, when it comes to, uh, you know, making a gladiator work in a campaign, one thing that I think would be cool, and I say this as someone who's had an arena in literally every single campaign that I've run, every single one, there's been some kind of arena story or tournament arc or something like that. Some, somehow, some way, I get my players into a pit to fight. In one case, multiple times. I was in my Dark Sun game. But what if there was an adventure or campaign built entirely around the arena? Everyone is playing a gladiator. Everyone needs to find some kind of variation in there, whether, you know, someone is a sword bard, someone's this built gladiator, someone's a rogue, you know, a wizard... How would it like? How would a wizard work in a gladiatorial setting? Um, I guess you'd have to be like a blade singer or something like that, a warlock. A lot. It would be very heavily focused on martial characters. There would probably be some kind of requirement of martial elements to every character, since it's so fight heavy. So, you know, you're playing a warlock, you'd have to be, like, packed to the blade. You'd have to play a blade lock. Um, clerics and paladins would be a little bit difficult to uh, to throw in there. Paladins I could see working. Um, cleric... I, I, again, how this would work is basically I'd need to hear your justification for why you're playing a pure spellcaster or a faith-based spellcaster in this this, uh, gladiator campaign. But the whole thing would be based around, uh, you know, figuring out who the best is. Or some kind of tournament, some kind of major event. And there would be, you know, combat in the arena and... uh, roleplay in kind of the backstage area with the trainers, with the owners... And inevitably, you know, there, there'd be some kind of plot going on, some kind of treachery backstage, someone's fixing fights, someone's murdering competition or competitors. Um, you know, there, there's some kind of no goodness going on No goodness, that's not a word. There's some kind of nefarious plot behind all of this. And ultimately, you would need to resolve that either, you know, by killing the person who's responsible, winning the tournament against all odds, and then killing them, revealing them in some way, you know, they... Everything would revolve around the arena, and the plot would revolve around the arena. And maybe you could do this over multiple arenas. You could also have a situation like um, Enter the Dragon or Mortal Kombat where everyone comes together for a combat tournament, but other people are there for other reasons. Uh, You know, like Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon is there as a secret agent to find out what the guy who runs that island is up to. I believe a couple of the Mortal Kombat characters... Uh, from the game are also, like, cops of some variety there to figure out what exactly is going on. So, yeah, I mean, Mortal Kombat is a good example of what all you could do um, as far as having a story set around a combat tournament or some kind of gladiatorial event. That's real, especially if you want pure spellcasters in there. I mean, Mortal Kombat would be kind of your model. 
So that's really where you could have characters like this shine. And honestly, that that would be something that I'd be up to the challenge of writing and maybe even releasing. I, I've been heavily contemplating writing my own modules and, you know, kind of making my own games, making my own adventures, publishing them, because I do it already for my, my players. So, you know, turning something like that into a published module especially for as much as you know my players tend to like my games i i think that's something that's worth pursuing and so i'm i'm definitely keeping that one in mind because i think there's a lot to work with there just as far as kind of following what mortal Kombat does or what you know the plot as it were of enter the dragon is blood sport you know all that stuff because there's more to those movies or video games in the case of Mortal Kombat than just the fighting in the arena. There's stuff that happens outside of the arena. There's fighting that happens outside of the arena. You know, there's there's intrigue, mystery, story. So codifying that into an actual adventure seems only natural to me. And I'd definitely be up for that challenge. So Hopefully, this has gotten your wheels turning as far as, you know, do you want to play a Gladiator in your next 5e game? Do you want to try and see if, you know, you can make a Battle Master fighter have the flavor of a Pit Fighter? Do you want to add a little bit of professional wrestling to what your character does? You know, do you want to run a game that's based on Mortal Kombat. Hopefully I've got you thinking. And hopefully I've excited a few of you with the idea of, you know, releasing something based on Mortal Kombat or uh, Gladiator or something like that that's, you know, built around the arena. So, guys, thank you so much for uh, tuning in and, and listening or watching i really appreciate it i hope you took something away from this just to let you know what's coming up next week i will be doing a review of two products one is going to be the second edition of index card rpg uh, by brandish gilhelm hanker infernell that guy been on the show twice great dude love him and so I'm going to be talking about Index Card RPG. And then I'm also going to be talking about another product that he put out uh, last year, which is 5e Hardcore Mode, uh, which basically takes 5e and makes it a lot easier for player characters to die, harder for things to heal. Kind of gives the game more of an OSR, old-school feel. Um... And so it might be an alternative for those of you who like the way that 5th uh, edition is designed. You like regular armor class. You like advantage and disadvantage. You know, all those mechanics you're generally a fan of, but you want a little bit of OSR flavor in it. I think 5e hardcore mode is going to be for you. I think, you know, honestly, it's going to it's going to work out pretty well. So we'll be talking about that next week. And uh, the week after that, I'm excited to say uh, Professor Dungeon Master from Dungeon Craft is going to be joining us on the show. Uh, I've really been into his videos recently. He's a great guy, um, you know, very intellectual, offers great practical advice, especially when it comes to like terrain and miniatures, which I'm super interested in. Uh, so he and I are going to be, you know, talking about all that stuff. I'm excited for it. I hope you guys are too. Uh, so, you know, next week, ICRPG 2nd Edition and uh, Hardcore Mode for 5e by Runehammer Games, Hanker and Fernell. And then the week after that, we'll be talking to Professor Dungeon Master. So, you know, guys, whether you rolled a 1 or a 20, I'm so glad that you rolled your bones with me, Ryan Howard. And I'll see you next time.